Hi, this is Phil from Simply Rhino and in this video we're going to take a look at developing and flattening surfaces in Rhino. The first example we're going to look at is fairly straightforward. This is a surface which is developable. That means that the surface will flatten out without any shrinking or stretching. And there are a couple of ways in which we can do this. Now, before we start flattening out this surface, I first of all want to just pick the surface, go to my object properties and increase the density of the isocurve display. The isocurves are essentially represent a number of the parameter curves that are used to actually build the surface. Because our four-sided NURB surface here has a much shorter edge at the top than the bottom, then fairly obviously the isocurves start to converge as they progress towards the top of the surface. Now I want to make use of these isocurves so that we can see what happens as this surface is developed in a number of ways. So I'm going to actually create curves from these isocurves and I'm going to do that by first of all switching layers here and then running a command from curves and curve from objects called extract wireframe and this will create curves from the boundary curves, the uh, surface edges and the visible isocurves. Okay. Now if I go to the actual object itself, object properties and I'm going to turn off the isocurve display now so that we can't see any isocurves. I'm then going to just lock the layer in which the surface is sitting and I'm going to remove the boundary curves and then I'm going to remove every other curve going from top to bottom here. just so we have a more sort of regular size of rectangular portion here on the surface. Okay, now first of all let's look at unrolling a surface, flattening this out and this is what we would do if we wanted to create a pattern for this part. So we do this from the surface menu and we use this command which is called unroll developable surface. Now before I run this command the developed pattern is always going to have a corner or a portion that sits on the origin. So I'm actually going to move this object out of the way a little just so we can, can get a better idea of the uh, development as we progress. So surface, unroll developable surface, I'm going to pick the surface that I want to develop and then I can optionally select curves on the surface that I want to unroll. So I'll just use my filter for this, just select curves only and I'll pick those curves followed by enter and you'll see the developed or unrolled surface. Now this is a fairly simple example of a developed surface and so our edge lengths here should be highly accurate. So we can test these by going to Analyze and Length and we can pick for example this top edge here 92.580 millimeters and we can pick this edge here for a comparison 92.581 millimeters so it's a thousandth of a millimeter away from the target and we'd see similar results for the other edges. So you can see here that the pattern actually represents the way in which these isocurves are displayed on the surface. So on the pattern, these isocurves are converging as they go move towards the, uh, the top edge of the pattern. That's fairly straightforward. Now there is a second way that we can create curves from a surface, which is slightly different to developing the surface by unrolling. And this is by creating UV curves. Now the UV curves are the parameter curves that actually make the surface. So we're going to get a slightly different result here than the developed pattern. This is a curve from object command and the command is create UV curves. So I'm going to pick the 
surface that I want to create the UV curves from and then just like the unroll command I'm going to be asked to select the curves on the surface that we want to create UV curves from so I'll go to my filter isolate the curves and just select those curves set the filter back and then finish the command this time you'll notice that we get a, a very rectangular result here I'm just going to move this out of the way and you'll also see that the one edge length here is the same so what we're actually getting with the UV curves is essentially this surface without this shortened edge so when this surface is created as a NURB surface this edge is shrunk uh, and because of the degree of the surface in V, uh, which is top to bottom in this case, then we get the progression of the shape from the top edge to the bottom edge. The UV curves are the, in very simple terms, the maximum length of the notional rectangular surface in the two directions. And here the isocurves obviously display as a regular rectangular shape. Now there is a benefit for us in being able to do that because this gives us a means to an end to put curves back onto my target surface because there is a reciprocal command which is called apply UV curves. So to demonstrate that I'm just going to switch layers and I'm going to just create a small rectangle here that is snapped to one of the rectangular regions here and I'm going to take that rectangle and also the boundary curve here and I'm going to change the object layer okay and I'm going to uh, make sure my center snaps on and I'm just going to draw for example an ellipse here uh, that just sits inside this rectangle and then I'm going to repeat this over the uh, rectangular curve here. So I'm just going to do this with the copy command and uh, the various options on this copy command that allow me to copy uh, at equal distances. Okay, so then I'll take this rectangle away. And so now I have a series of ellipses and I can apply these back onto this surface. Let's just change the layer color here so we can see what's happening a little better. So the command here is again curve from objects and this time it's apply UV curves. So I can pick all of the curves that I want to apply uh, onto the surface. These curves by the way need to sit on the uh, the XY plane and then I can pick, pick the surface that I want to apply them to. Okay and you'll see in applying these to the surface then fairly obviously these ellipses deform and get um, narrower as we progress from the top to the bottom. So this can be used as a means to an end to, as in this case, apply a regular pattern onto a developable surface and then we can unroll that surface and its attendant curves and create the correct pattern for this three-dimensional object. Okay, now we've seen that first simple example, let's now take a look at how the way in which a surface is built influences the way in which the development behaves. Here we have a couple of three-dimensional curves and a couple of straight lines. And I'm going to build a very similar surface but build it in two different ways. So first of all I'm going to use the edge curve command on these four curves on the left to create an untrimmed surface and on the right I'm going to loft 
these two two-dimensional curves and I'm going to trim the top and bottom of the loft to give me a trimmed surface. Now when we look at these surfaces uh, like this uh, the two look very similar and indeed their surface area is the same and their boundary is the same. However if we select both surfaces and we increase the ice curve density as in the previous examples you can see that the surface structure in these two surfaces is quite different. Okay if we um, do something uh, similar to previous so we extract the wireframe from these two surfaces let's just put them uh, on this layer here then turn this off and just remove these boundaries okay and then let's have a look at the development of these so let's first of all take a look at unrolling this surface and uh, let's make sure that we turn the isocurve display off of these as well so unroll developable surface and then pick the curves and there's the result and let's repeat the process for this one over here and fairly obviously that's the result of that one. So you can see that although the curves on the surface are moving in different directions the boundary is absolutely uh, identical. The difference occurs when we come to use the UV curve command. So create UV curves That's this one over here. And create UV curves. And we'll look at this one over here. And you can see this gives us a very different result because this is an untrimmed surface. And so these 16 rectangular portions here represent these 16 rectangular portions here whereas here this is trimmed surface and those rectangular portions would in fact uh, extend beyond this curved boundary here. So the relevance of this is that if you are using a command where you are moving from 2D to 3D so for example flow along surface um, if you can use an untrimmed surface like this example on the left and a UV grid like this one here then you can get a much uh, more easily controllable result than you can on a trimmed surface. So just to very quickly demonstrate if we use this grid here and we put uh, an array of uh, identical components on here group them together we can use flow along surface pick the array use the plane option here to mark the boundary and click on the appropriate corner of this surface and you'll see that this array of objects deforms onto the surface and the objects reduce in size basically according to the structure of the surface. If we flow the objects again using the same process onto the trimmed surface then what's going to happen is that the flow is going to not recognize the trim and recognize the untrimmed boundary of the surface and so it would be much more difficult to create a local set of components here because all of these components would need to have some curvature to them and most of the 16 components would need to be different so it would be a much more difficult routine to work out 
than by using the untrimmed surface on the left. Poly surfaces as well as single surfaces can be unrolled. Here we have a fairly basic model of a paper or card carrier bag and let's just move this again away from the origin and look at the alternatives for unrolling this. So again we can use the unroll command and when we use this command on a poly surface the explode option uh, and the label option comes into play. So here I'm going to say no to both the explode and the labels option and just look at the uh, result that we get here. So here you can see that the coincident edges are where possible uh, kept together so that we can actually have a cutout pattern in this case that we can fold and fold back into the three-dimensional bag. For complex shapes we can turn on the labeling and the idea of this is that we'll then get some annotation dots on particular edges uh, that we can match up to particular edges here And also, if I turn the labels off, uh, we can explode the faces that we are developing so that each one of our faces is on a separate surface. So again, with that option, it may make sense to use the labeling so that we can see where each part fits relative to the next part. All of the examples we've looked at so far have been simple developable surfaces. These will flatten without any stretching or shrinking of the material and unroll, for example, like a sheet of paper. These surfaces are always linear in one direction. Now, if we try to use the unroll surface command on a double curved surface, we'll see in the command line that Rhino will report that the unroll surf command won't work on the surface because it's doubly curved. The command line also suggests using the smash command. Now smash is one of the two commands in Rhino that will attempt to flatten the surface with double curvature. With the smash command, however, one of the surface directions, either U or V, is always treated as being linear. You can make the choice in the command line option or let the command choose by using the natural option. So let's have a look at the uh, smash command uh, working. Now, first of all, I'm going to go to my object and just for clarity, I'm going to turn off the ISO curves and I'm also going to show on a separate layer some curves that I've already pulled off the surface that are extracted ISO curves. So again we can see the structure of the surface. So let's take a look at using smash. We can choose uh, if we have a poly surface whether to explode and use labels and uh, keep the properties and indeed we can use smash on an example like the paper bag that we looked at previously and achieve the same result as unroll. So here I'm going to pick the surface and then I have the option for the linear direction and I can choose natural which will let Rhino decide or I can choose U or V. So let's choose U for example and then I can select the curves on the surface that I also want to unroll and run the command. Okay so this is the uh, result that we see here. And let's just move this out of the way. And let's run this again using the V option.
OK, so you can see here the smash command is doing some strange things with these uh, curves on the surface. So the uh, structure of the surface isn't really uh, preserved during the flattening. What happens is this, is that if we look at the uh, U example here uh, and we look at the boundary lengths, uh, we'll see that uh, this length is considerably shorter and this length across here is the same. So it keeps the edge length uh, of the one direction and likewise with this command here it will keep the edge length of this direction. So this is the direction here in this case that's being treated as being linear and you can see this by the almost straight lines that are uh, running through here. So clearly this isn't really going to give us a realistic development of this shape because we would expect all four sides of this shape to be curved. So we could use this as a starting point and maybe start to work out our own development of the surface but there is probably a better way of uh, achieving this in Rhino. Now there is another command that we can use which is called unroll surface UV and this is a, a, a version of the, the smash command that will actually preserve the UV direction um, of the target surface. The smash command is uh, itself going to be somewhat arbitrary. So let's just have a look at unroll surface UV. Uh, options are exactly the same as smash uh, and let's choose the uh, U direction here, pick the curves on the surface to unroll and take a look at this. Now let's just examine this in wireframe. Here you can see now that this command preserves the surface structure as compared to, to this one here. And so if you are, for example, want to use this uh, as a means to an end to go from 2D to 3D, then this is a, a better way of progressing. So the UV direction is maintained and the structure of these curves on the surfaces uh, is a little better. Let's just have a look at this in the other direction. So linear direction V, curves on the surface to unroll and I should have moved this out of the way beforehand. OK, so there we go. So now you can see that these curves are actually uh, now straight, whereas here they are not equally spaced and they are uh, slightly uh, less than, than straight as well. So this is a, a, a command where you will get exactly the same boundary condition, but you will get a better internal uh, sort of representation of any curves that you have on the surface. Now, of course, if you want to use uh, a similar process for using, for example, flow along surface, then you can still use create UV curves for this, create and apply UV curves. This command will work on, on, on any type of surface, whether it's um, a, uh, a single or a, a double curvature. Of course, with this type of surface, it's difficult to, to work out which side is, is which here. So you might want to, for example, first of all, check the direction of the surface and then maybe put some sort of marker curve onto the surface here, like this, and then just take that curve and pull it onto the surface. And then this is going to give me a, a reference as to which corner is which. Okay, so I now know that this corner equates to, to this corner here. So again, this is a, a valid way of being able to take a regular object and to uh, push it back with using something like the flow command and have the object actually move in the UV direction of the surface. So we've seen that the smash command is fairly limiting and the smash command works really only reliably on surfaces that have a very small amount of double curvature. 
if we have a surface as we've looked at which has got quite a pronounced double curvature then the best results that we're going to get for, our, for flattening this are going to come from a command called squish. Now the squish command allows for stretching and shrinking of the material as it's flattened out into the pattern. Now this command is a type in command only and has a number of options. So first of all I'll type in the command and you'll see I have some command line options. The first option is to split the seams. So if we have a shape, for example, which is more convoluted than this shape, then we can open out those seams as we flatten out the surface to help us create a better pattern. Preserving the boundary will attempt to conserve the lengths of the, uh, in this case, of our four edges. And then we have uh, a deformation option. This allows us for a free deformation, which will uh, both stretch and shrink locally where it needs to, to flatten out the shape. And then we can choose to stretch mostly, only, compress mostly, etc. And we can use our own custom setups here. So let's choose free for the moment. Then we can choose a material, either a floppy or a rigid material, and this uh, really is fairly self-explanatory. If we're trying to develop something, for example, for a shoe upper, we would choose a floppy material. If we were trying to develop something, for example, like a steel or a metal panel for uh, the side of a boat hull, we would use the rigid option. Outside up, we'll put the pattern in the direction of the surface normals or in the reverse direction if the uh, down option is chosen. And the decorate option will give us some points on the surface which shows uh, where in fact the surface has shrunk and where it has um, expanded. So let's take a look at this command and we'll use the decorate option saying yes, deformation using free on a floppy material. Uh, and we're trying to preserve the boundaries. So we pick the surface and then as usual we can pick any curves on the surface and then we can enter to run the command. And you can see here that we have a mixture of red and green dots. The green dots are where the pattern is stretched and the red dots are where the pattern is compressed. And these annotation markers here show me the percentage of where the maximum amount of compression is. Okay, we'll also see a repeat of this in the command line as well. Whatever layer we have active when we run the squish command is where the red and green annotation will be placed. So it's a good idea to do this on a separate layer and then you can keep this annotation uh, and not have it affecting the surface or the curves on the surface. Let's now have a look at uh, what's happened with the edge lengths on this. Uh, so the idea is because of the options that we used here then the command is going to try and maintain these edge lengths but they are uh, probably not going to be accurate. Now, if we just analyze the length of, for example, a curve on this edge here, and that is 234.842, and compare it to this edge here, uh, you can see here it's 225.334. So this length has, uh, edge length has increased. And of course, you would expect that because most of the pattern has actually expanded in order to, or stretched, in order to actually develop our shape. Now there are ways of actually that we might be able to constrain those boundary proportions much closer to this if that indeed was a, a driving factor and we'll look at that in a moment. Um, but before we do that um, one of the things that's um, important to understand with the command is that this surface here that uh, is generated is actually going to be a trimmed surface and for that reason if we look to analyze the length of the surface edge then this will select as one complete trimmed edge. So it might be wise if you needed the four separate edges to make sure that you pick those as part of the curves on surface object or indeed you had these separately as a series of curves that you picked. 
just so that you end up with a, a curve here that describes that edge. It then makes comparing edge lengths a lot easier. If we want to control the edge length a little better, we can look at using the custom settings when we use Squish. So we'll run the Squish command and we'll use a custom setting here for the deformation. And we set the custom setup here and we choose a preset to modify and we have three presets, all of which will default to the same value to start off with. I'm going to choose A and we have a control for the boundary stretch, the boundary compression, the interior stretching and the interior compression. And if I use an increase value, let's say of around 200 for the boundary and for the interior compression here, this will restrain the boundary and the surface from being expanded too much. Pick the surface and then the curves on the surface and have a look at the result. So you can see that the pattern now starts to look different and also you can see the, the way here in which the isocurve that we uh, extracted on the surface are now being treated slightly differently, the, the edges. So there is a, something of a penalty for trying to match these edge length here in the shape of the pattern. But let's just have a look at what uh, length we get. And here the target was 225 and... Here, if I pick that edge, now we're 227. And here on this edge, we are 169. And here we're 165. So you can see that by using these custom controls, we can create boundary lengths that are closer to the existing. But remember with a shape like this that you would expect the boundary length on the pattern to probably, particularly with a floppy material, be longer than it is in the three-dimensional shape. Finally, let's look at running Squish and going back to the uh, pretty much the defaults, which is a free deformation preserving the boundary and not splitting the scenes and using a, a floppy material. I'm going to turn off the decoration and I'm going to once again produce the curves on the surface. There is a reciprocal command to squish which is called squish back and this allows me to for example to put some curves onto the flat pattern or indeed points onto the pattern and squish them back onto the three-dimensional object. So let's just take a look at this. So if I use some text that I'm going to convert into curves and place this on here, just scale this slightly. And place this on here. Then Again, by using a, uh, a type in command, which is called squish back, I can pick the 2D pattern and then the curves that I want to squish onto the surface, followed by an enter, and you'll see these push themselves onto the surface. Now, the advantage in the squish back and the squish command is that even if you're not going to use the developed pattern as a, a means for production, it's a really nice way of being able to iterate between 2D and 3D. And here, for example, if we undid that squish back, um, and let's say I wanted to make my text so it ran along this, more closely along this ISO line here, then obviously on the pattern, I could use the bend command, select the text, and maybe bend this twice, once, this way. Might be better if we group this as well. Pull this down to here and then bend it the other way. Okay, it needs a little bit more work in the in the middle, but you get the general idea. And then now if we apply this 
onto the surface using the squish back command. You know, we can get this text to fit a little more closely to the ISO line. So that's a brief introduction to flattening and developing surfaces in Rhino. I hope you found this useful and if so, please like this video. To be kept informed of new videos as they're posted, you can subscribe to this channel. At Simply Rhino we deliver a series of classroom courses and can deliver bespoke training either on site or in our own classroom. You can find details of all our upcoming training courses on our website. Thanks for watching.